All right, so let's get started. Oh, give me one sec. Let me just take a picture of your attendance first. All right, so as you can see today, we're gonna see the modern art. So um, there are so many art movements in the modern um, era, you know, uh, era. So um, probably um, you will see the modern art um, today and Wednesday and next Monday's meeting for the three sessions. So the uh, modernity in Europe and North America reflected the emergence of a new kind of society in the wake of the French, American, and industrial revolutions. Uh, driven by technological progress and characterized by rapid change, the 19th century gave birth to our industrialized middle-class culture of mass production, mass advertising, and mass consumption, including the mass consumption of leisure activities, such as shopping, going to entertainments, and visiting art museums. Uh, art museums themselves were a development of the 19th century, and they made art available to the public in a way we now take for granted. So if um, someone was coming in and disappeared. All right, so um, does anyone know this building? It's in Paris. Do you know what it is? You know what? It's a Rubro Museum. So, it's a what? Rubro Museum is the first national museum uh, in Paris. Uh, the name is the Rubro. So, um, so art uh, was now for everybody. Um, you know, since the uh, the Rubro Museum you now um, you now built in Paris. Uh, so no longer by the church or by the nobility. So that is the huge change in the modern art from the, uh, you know, the 17th and 18th century art. All right, so um, many of the scholars agree that uh, modern artists started from the Rubro Museum in Paris in uh, 1793, uh, and it ended after World War II. So the modern art from the you know, Rubro Museums now to the um, World War II. The modern art is divided as two periods. So, before avant-garde, so there was a, a art movement called like avant-garde. Um, so the modern art is divided as two period, before avant-garde and after avant-garde. So, uh, you know, we learned the photography chapter, um, you know, before the midterm, right? Um, so the first photograph in the world Daguerreotype came out of the world during this modern time. Uh, as a photograph had developed, many artists you know, abandoned the traditional art style and they tried the new style of art, right? Because the traditional art was not meaningful anymore thanks to the um, invention of camera. That also happened during this time period, but the beginning of the modern art movement were still realistic. Now, the before avant-garde art movements are still realistic 
and their arts were based on the true observation because um, the photographs uh, development was um, just a baby step and it wasn't threatening for the painters that much. However, after the Garrett type, the photographs uh, development was accelerated and by 1888, the Kodak, the Kodak invented a portable camera and everyone could record their mundane life. So, the artist needed something new rather than the realistic art. So that art movement is called like avant-garde, means newest art. And after avant-garde, the art history began to write a totally different story. So, so before, so here is the avant-garde. Before avant-garde, there are um, three major art movements, like realism, impressionism, and post-impressionism. And after avant-garde, diverse art movement arose, you know, like Fauvism, Expressionism, Cubism, Futurism, Dada, Surrealism, Idealism. So these are all the you know, non-representational art after avant-garde. Because mm -hmm. after avant-garde, because of the photographs, um, the manual and the traditional style of art are, are uh, now no longer needed. So um, we're gonna see this you now three um, art movement before the avant-garde realism, uh, impressionism, post-impressionism today. So let's see the realism first. So um, a number of artists uh, broke away from the traditions of earlier 18th and 19th century. So art to create the objective representations of the real world. So the movement called realism refers specifically to writers and artists. Um, in French, um, in France, who were concerned about achieving social change after the revolution of 1848. So realist artists sought to depict the everyday and the ordinary rather than historic, heroic, or the exotic. So that is the main point of the realism art movement. So there was a mask for art viewers, uh, the true lives, you know, the true lives of the middle and the lower classes. So let's just quickly remind you now uh, what we learned in last week uh, and before the last week. So we learned the Renaissance and the Baroque and the Rococo art, right? And then the you now um, the themes of art for those um, art movement were you know, the biblical episode or the, you know, novel's life, right? On the other hand, you know, now in the modern art, especially, you know, for the realist artist, their theme and the subject is just mundane life, normal people's life. So we saw this, you know, work before, right? The realist art artist the honor dormier's uh, lithography printing work of art so you know we saw this work when we learned contextual analysis before he recorded a historically terrible event of the normal people uh, like you know not the upper class people you know about the you know lower class people in this work so uh, I'm, I'm sorry. So let me just read this, you know, you know treasure story again. So uh, major French cities, including you know, Lyon and Paris, revolted April 15, 
1834, the Parisian stand barricades in the streets. And during the attack of one of the barricades by the army, Transnomian Street, an infantry captain was killed. Give me one second. By a shot fired from a house. The next day, the soldiers will attack very hard rioters uh, and will break down the doors of the building at number 12 Rue Transnomian, uh, supposed to be the one from which the party was shot. And all residents of the building, including old men, women, and children, were massacred. A bloody event that will remain in history as the uh, massacre of Transnomian Street, imaged by the painter and uh, caricaturist Honor Dormier. So, like that, um, realist artist recorded the true life of the lower classes. Not the, you know, uh, biblical episode, not the you know, upper class life. So let's see another example of the realist uh, realism. So everyone, let's look at this painting. What can you see? What's the theme of this work? Two men is working. Mm -hmm. The men are working. Very good. What are they doing? Looks like they're building a wall. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Or a barricade of some kind. Mm -hmm. It's possible, yeah, with the stones, yes. Maybe, you know, that's why they're breaking the stones. Yeah, very good guess. Exactly, they're working. Mm -hmm. So this painting, Stone Breakers, was shocking for uh, its depiction of working class people on a large sized canvas. So look at the size. The size is huge. So this scale normally reserved for the heroic subject matter of history paintings. So this artist, Corbett, this painting highlights the backbreaking, monotonous work of the poor. The breaking of stones was a job taught by older generations to young men. And it was a job a man would have for a lifetime. So the painting shows an older worker and his young assistant as powerful and unrelenting qualities that alarmed the upper classes. And a year before, Kerbet painted this work um, in the revolution, working conditions and to low pay. So we can say it's a true realism work. So now let's move on to the next art movement before the avant-garde, Impressionism. So the artists who came to be called Impressionist worked in individual, sometimes very different styles, um, but they were um, united in rejecting the uh, formal approach of the art taught in the academy in Paris. So their art attempted not so much to portray exactly and realistically such scenes as a landscape or a life in a city as to capture the light and the uh, sensations produced by the scene. Um, so the Impressionists formed a group to show their work together outside the official salon. Uh, in eight exhibitions held between eight, um, 1874 and 1886. So um, their subject matter was a scene of everyday life, rural landscapes, uh, and life in the modern and growing cities of France. Uh, impresses were often intent on capturing the essence of moments in time. So before the Impressionists, artists who followed the traditional method of painting gave their work a smooth surface. But, you know, on the other hand, look at this painting. Impressionists chose to reveal their brochure strokes like this. Uh, the brochure strokes away from the academic tradition of 
implying creating an illusion of three-dimensional space on the canvas. Instead, impressionists flatten the space, welcome the texture created by the paint, and often allowed the canvas to be seen beneath the painting. So many impressionist paintings do indeed have an apparently unfinished quality because the artists are interested in capturing uh, instantaneous moments rather than creating a highly finished, technically flawless piece of work. So um, we are going to see three impressionist artists based on this background. So the first impressionist artist is Edward Manette. Edward Manette, um, he was a, a French modernist painter um, and he was one of the first 19th century, first um, 19th century artists to paint modern life and a pivotal figure uh, in the transition from realism to impressionism. So everyone, let's talk about this painting. Please, you know, take a look at this painting closer. Can you guess what the story is? Can you get, can you read this painting? Can you find the uh, artist intention of this painting? <laughs> I'm not sure, but it looks like prostitution. Oh, maybe. Yeah, very good guess. You know what? Um, actually, the Edward Manette, um, he was very interested, you know, um, he always used that, you know, prostitute subject uh, for his painting so many times, so many times. So it was very good guess. Any other opinion? Is this an artist and perhaps maybe she might be the subject? Mm -hmm. Maybe, yeah, yeah. You know what? Um, normally, um, Manette's paintings are uh, hard to read. Um, now, let's just, you know, um, take a look at this painting together. So why this front woman is naked and posed like that? Mm. And where is she looking at? So it seems like she's looking at us, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's looking at yeah. us. Mm -hmm. And look at this, you know, the gentlemen. Why these men are dressed up and act like there are only two of them? Mm -hmm. That looks also, you know, odd. And she's naked. And look at the other woman in the back. The other woman in the back looks like she got clothes on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the you know, intention of the composition looks very, you know, you know, hard to read, hard to guess. Yeah. But you guys are really, you know, did the great guess. So, mm, Manette's painting is odd. And art historians still debate just what he meant by it. <laughs> uh, in modeling his figures, he focused on the highest and the lowest values, and all but eliminating the middle um, and the transitional tones. So as a result, forms such as this nude woman's body appear flattened as a throw uh, illuminated by a sudden flash of light. So we're gonna watch a video together to see this work of art closer. We're in the museum. 
Musée d'Orsay, looking at Déjeuner sur l'herbe, Luncheon on the Grass. By Manet, although it didn't originally have that title. Its first title was The Bath. And there is really neither bathing nor a luncheon <laughs> going on. There is a woman in the distance, in the water. There is some fruit and a brioche, a roll in the foreground. So perhaps a remnant of a lunch, but that's not what this painting is about. But it's very difficult to determine precisely what this painting is about, and I think that's part of the point. The painting was exhibited not at the official salon sanctioned by the Royal Academy of Fine Arts, the authority for art. Instead, this was exhibited at the Salon des Refusés. The Salon des Refusés was set up by Emperor Napoleon III because so many works of art had been excluded from the official salon. But even though this painting was in the exhibition of rejected artwork, it still caused a storm of controversy based both on what was being portrayed but also its painting technique, how it was portrayed. These figures are clearly modern Parisian figures. And that's the problem. They're not set far away in ancient Greek and Roman mythology or set back in time. These are figures clearly wearing fashionable Parisian clothing, except, of course, the nude woman, which is the other part of the problem. By placing a woman who is nude in this context, and because she's not veiled or distanced by mythology, she's not a nymph in a classical grove. She is actually a recognizable figure. This is Manet's model, Victorine Moron. And because the two men are also recognizable figures, there is an immediacy here that creates a degree of discomfort for the viewer. These figures don't look idealized. They don't look timeless. They look like actual people you would see on the streets of Paris. The other significant problem with these three figures is that no one seems to be truly interacting. The nude female figure looks directly out at us in a gaze that is very nonchalant and yet very direct. Which is also breaking with tradition. In the rare instances where a nude female figure would look out toward the audience, it might be with a coy look. But here there is a figure that's returning the viewer's gaze. And then we have the two male figures. The figure on the right gestures toward the figure in the center, but the figure in the center seems to gaze absently out of the painting and doesn't seem to return the figure on the right's gesture and conversation. And then we have this odd figure in the background who's spatially too large for where she should be in the middle ground. There are all kinds of spatial problems here that Manet has built in. These are not happenstance. These are purposeful. For example, the woman in the background seems to reach down to scoop something out of the water, but in fact, she seems to be reaching down to the thumb of the man in the foreground, collapsing the last traces of the illusion of depth. We also have figures who are rendered very flatly. So, for example, the nude female figure is not modeled with that lovely movement from light to dark that would give her a sense of three-dimensionality that is typical of representations of the female nude historically. Critics noted that she seemed to have a kind of studio lighting about her instead of the natural outdoor light of where she's located. There is some minor modeling around the breast, under the thigh, but for the most part, she looks like she's a flat cutout. And even those shadows are very dark. There's almost a sense of her being outlined in dark gray and blacks instead of a lovely soft modeling. Overall, the handling of paint, whether we're looking at the grass in the foreground or the meadow in the distance, it's incredibly loosely brushed. There's no sense of finish. And for paintings that were approved by the jury for the Royal Academy, having a painting that was really worked on, where there was no sense left of the hand of the artist, that was the priority. And Manet is just flagrantly disregarding that. We also have a figure who seems naked and not nude. And that's because we have her discarded clothing, including her hat, in the foreground, and the fact that she's wearing a kind of ribbon. So we feel as though she's a modern Parisian woman who has discarded her clothing and not Venus, born nude naturally from the sea. She's not an allegorical figure. She's not a mythological figure. She's somebody who has taken off her dress. Manet is very consciously drawing on the tradition of art history here. He understood traditional art. He had copied paintings at the Louvre. And so this painting is based directly on at least two sources, a painting that was thought to be by Giorgione, now understood to be by Titian in the Louvre, which similarly shows two clothed male figures and two nude female figures in a beautiful landscape. 
But Déjeuner Solerbe is also inspired by a work by Raphael that Manet had seen through an engraved copy showing the judgment of Paris. And in the lower right corner of that engraving were two river gods and a nymph. And it was that composition that Manet has borrowed. So we can easily understand the reactions of the French public in 1863 when they went to the Salon des Refusés. In fact, Manet was cultivating their confusion. This refusal to tell a story is a refusal to do precisely what the Academy and especially the art-going public wanted from a painting. Manet is teasing his viewers. He's giving all of the indications that there's a narrative and yet not including that narrative. And so the subject is then no longer what is being enacted, but rather the act of creating a work of art itself. The choices that he's making as an artist to his brushwork, to his composition. He is making a challenge to the authorities that controlled art in France and making a strong declaration. I am the one who makes these decisions for my art. And that forceful declaration will have a tremendous impact on the development of modernism in the late 19th century and into the 20th century. All right. Does it help to understand this work? Not really. <laughs> it helps. It helps. <laughs> right. It helps, but they don't even really know either. No, they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it helps. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we saw this work before, so let's just skip this work. And now let's move on to the uh, another Impressionist artist, Claude Monet. Um, Claude Monet stands like no other painter for the Impressionist style. And uh, uh, as the French master of light, he was also a central pioneer of 20th century painting. Uh, when Monet traveled to Paris to visit the Rouvre Museum, the first museum in the world, um, he witnessed um, painters copying from the old masters. However, Monet brought his paints and other tools with him and sit by a window, not in, in front of the masterpieces, he just sit uh, by a window and painted what he saw, the outside, you know. So Monet was in Paris for several years and met several painters who would become friends and uh, fellow impressionists. So one of those friends was Edward Manet. We just saw him. Um, so Impressionism, some, some writes this title of this, um, you know, painting. Um, so this painting is, uh, um, you know, um, is the you know, first shown painting by um, Claude Monet um, and, the, um, and what would become known as the exhibition of the Impressionists in Paris in uh, April 18. Um, 74. Um, the painting is credited with uh, inspiring the name of the Impressionist move movement. Uh, Impressionism, sunrise depicts a port in Monet's hometown. And Monet painted the same subject in many times because the lights and the sceneries are different by the time, by the day and by the weather. So, you know, he's showing the, you know, the impressionist um, work of art from this painting. And he liked to paint the nature views outside to capture all the difference of lighting while he was painting. And this is another beautiful landscape painting. Uh, and he used brush stroke speed to show the time. So through this painting, we now even could feel the windy weather with the brush stroke. That's the one of the feature of the Impressionism art. 
Um, Mona was diagnosed with nuclear cataracts in both eyes in 1912 uh, at the age of 20, I'm sorry, 72. His visual problems began much earlier. Uh, soon after the age 65, he began to experience changes in his perception of color. Uh, in his eye, um, everything looked blurry and yellowish and brownish to him. Mm. After he was diagnosed cataracts, he spent uh, most of his time at his garden. And he left so many beautiful garden landscape paintings like this. And he died at uh, 86. So I'm going to share a video to show his beautiful um, you know, landscape painting from his, guard, uh, from his garden. Comment je suis venu ici, c'est la, la destinée. Euh, c'est vrai. Je ne pensais pas euh, m'occuper d'un jardin comme celui-ci. Monet a été une étape dans la peinture et son jardin en fait partie. Look familiar? Welcome to the garden of none other than Claude Monet, the father of French Impressionism. Worldwide renowned painter who planted his own garden here in Giverny in 1883 and replicated it time and time again on canvases. And this is Gilbert. He's an artist in his own right. He has been responsible for the upkeep of Monet's garden for over 40 years. After the Second World War, the garden was left neglected. So in the 1970s, gardeners were called to the rescue. Donc je suis venu travailler ici en, pour la restauration en 1976. Tout était mort. Donc il a fallu tout recommencer. J'avais un plan de rester trois ou quatre ans, mais en fin de compte, euh, j'y suis encore malgré ma retraite. Maintenant, c'est un jardin hyper connu et hyper fréquenté. Alors, euh, plus de 600 000 visiteurs en six mois. En ce moment, nous sommes dix jardiniers à plein temps. Je suis euh, retraité. Pour moi, c'est facile. J'habite à côté, donc de revenir dans le jardin. La, la, la journée commence à 7h du matin pour l'été, pas l'hiver parce qu'il n'y a pas le soleil, on vit comme, le, comme la lumière. On répare ce que les visiteurs ont cassé, euh, certains partent couper les fleurs fanées, c'est très important. On fertilise, on arrose, c'est tout le travail d'un jardinier. Gilbert wasn't the greatest connoisseur of Monet, but he got to know him through his garden. C'est plutôt les fleurs qui m'intéressaient et petit à petit j'ai appris à découvrir Monet. Donc, euh, et aimer. C'est très important de préserver ce jardin parce qu'il a marqué l'histoire de la peinture. Le jardin, ça a été ma destinée. So, was his beautiful art and painting? Now let's see the third Impressionist artist, uh, Auguste Renoir. Uh, Auguste Renoir was a uh, um, French artist who was uh, a leading painter in the development of the Impressionist style. Uh, he depicted beauty and uh, especially feminine sensuality. Uh, this painting is one of the uh, Impressionism's most celebrated masterpieces the painting depicts a typical Sunday afternoon at the um, uh, original uh, Moulin de Margaret in the district of Montmartre in Paris. Uh, in the late 19th century, working class Parisians would dress up and spend time there dancing, drinking, and eating just like our life. <laughs> And he left so many beautiful portrait paintings like this. So look at the brush stroke on her hair depiction. Looks very you now soft, but every single strokes are 
alive. And this is another portrait work by uh, August Renoir. So this is a very unusual portrait style. It doesn't look like you know traditional portrait style um, in terms of the composition and the focusing. The composition is not you know uh, focusing on the figures, you know, nor the landscape. Even the kid uh, doesn't show full front, uh, full you know torso in this painting. So um, he tried to uh, create a unique portrait style through this painting. And Renoir show completed technique uh, as impressionist through this um, painting. Uh, there is a video about his life uh, with his beautiful masterpieces in the modern room page. Please watch the video uh, to fully understand this artist after this meeting. Now let's move on to the third art movement before the avant-garde post-impressionism. Uh, the next generation of artists admired many aspects of impressionism, especially its bright and the palette and uh, direct painting technique. Uh, but they reacted in various ways to what they perceived as its uh, shortcomings. Their styles are so highly personal that we commonly group them together under the neutral term post-impressionist, uh, meaning simply the artist who came after impressionism. So we are going to see three uh, post-impressionist artists, Georges Sherrod, uh, Vincent van Gogh, and Paul Gauguin. So let's see Georges Sherrod first. Um, Georges Sherrod wanted to place Impressionism's intuitive recording of optical sensations on a more scientific footing. His reading of color theories lead, um, lead him to um, develop the technique of pointillism uh, in which um, discrete dots and dashes of pure contemporary colors were supposed to blend in the viewer's eye. You know, it sounds like familiar with us. We learned his art before, this one. We learned his artistic technique in visual elements chapter 4D, optical color mixture, right? So he painted all the colors with the color dots. He didn't use direct colors. He used the optical color mixture. So for example, to make the green color in this painting, he used the yellow dots and the blue dots. And when the you know, lots of color dots put together, you know, they create new color. So let me share a video to see his, um, pointillism painting in detail. Some say they see poetry in my paintings. I see only science. We're in the Art Institute of Chicago and we're looking at Sunday afternoon on the Isle of the Grand Jatte by Georges Seurat. And that was a quote by Seurat, whose ambition was to bring science to the methods of Impressionism. What's interesting is that the science that he was thinking about has been, to some extent, overturned, and we're left with the poetry. The science that he was referring to had to do with ways of making the painting seem more luminous, to seem brighter. And I have to say, he's really succeeded. This is a painting that is brilliantly luminous and incredibly complex when it comes to color. So he's taking the earlier traditions of the Impressionists and he's imposing on them the science of vision and especially the science of color that had been developed by people like Chevroy and Rude. He was interested in this idea of dividing color into its components. That is, instead of trying to find the perfect person Purple, which is really hard to do. You mean when you mix it on your palette? Well, that's right. And the reason is that when you take, say, a blue and a red and you mix them together, that red is not pure red. It's got lots of other things in it. The blue is not pure. And when you mix them together, it gets too muddy. So how do you get a pure purple that you might see in nature? Well, Seurat's solution was to take the red, take the blue, and put them next to each other so that as your eye receives that light, the light waves do the mixing themselves. Right. And this is called optical mixture. And this is really a change from academic technique of finding that low 
local color of an object, mixing it on your palette and then applying it. And if you think back to the Impressionist project, that what the Impressionist sought after was to really create a sense of outdoor light. And I think using this divisionist method, this idea of optical mixture, Sura really did that in the Grand Shot. We have a real sense of Parisians outside on a sunny day and the real strong sense of sunlight streaming through the trees. So clearly there is this bridge back to Impressionism, and in fact the artist used the term Neo-Impressionism when he described the kind of painting that he was doing. And yet this is also so far away from Impressionism. It's got the leisure of the Impressionist painting, it's got the outside, but this is not a painting that was painted plein air. This is not done directly before these subjects. He did do small sketches. Actually dozens of drawings and oil sketches outside, that's right. But then he goes back to the studio and makes this very composed, very carefully struck painting. In fact, he said that he wanted his figures to have the kind of solemnity that was found in the sculptures of the frieze of the Parthenon. Right, so he's really wanting to bring a sense of timelessness and classicism to the art of Impressionism, and also, as you said, a sense of thoughtfulness, of composing, of not doing something spontaneous. The figures are remarkably structured within this space, and the space itself is also remarkably organized. And there's much more of an illusion of space than we would ever get in an Impressionist painting. Well, almost going back to the classical tradition of landscape painting of Claude or of Poussin, you have alternating shadow and light, which steps us back slowly into space. And we also have a receding diagonal line that creates an illusion of space. And yet at the same time, this is a painting because of its technique that really draws our eye to the surface of the canvas. So there's this really interesting tension that exists between this deep pictorial space and the very obvious, heavily worked surface. Let's go up really close and take a look. So I'm looking at the lower left corner of the painting, and I'm looking at the man who's smoking a pipe, leaning on his back. Take a close look at the way that his body is defined. You can see some of the earlier painting. I see blues, I see reds, and I see yellows, all fairly long strokes. But then I also see, it's painted over that, little points of color of pinks and of blues as well that Seurat actually added a bit later. And you can see that, especially in the shadows and the highlights at the top and the bottom, where in a sense creates a kind of volume. And as we're looking at all of these different brush strokes that are layered one on the other, I'm also noticing how the figure has really clear contours, which is something that we don't see in Impressionism. So we have a sense of line here and a form defined by line and even modeling. So the figure really seems three-dimensional. So we know that we're in the northwest of Paris in a place that was frequented by the middle and upper classes for leisure. We know that the other side of the river was frequented more by working class figures. And so there's this question of what Seurat is saying about class and Paris in the 19th century. And here, art historians really disagree. And it's in part because there's a lot of ambiguity. The ambiguity of class was an issue of his moment, of his time. Class was enormously important and it had always been in French society absolutely clear, but the cities had a way now of mixing classes and this was a modern phenomenon. There was a way that clothing and fashion now blurred class distinctions that were more clear before. One of the things that Seurat is doing is he's confounding the expectations of a typical viewer in the end of the 19th century. So where someone would expect to see a narrative, a pretty story that was easily readable between the figures, a sense of sentiment or emotion. Seurat is not giving us that. We have figures who don't talk to each other, don't interact. We don't have a sense of a clear narrative. It just doesn't do what 19th century viewers wanted paintings to do. And so this painting was a challenge not only for that typical viewer that you spoke of, but for the art community as well. When this painting was first exhibited in 1886, it caused a real stir, and artists divided into camps, supporting it or detracting from it. Well, it was so different than anything anyone was doing. I mean, it exploded what the most advanced art of the time was. At that point, in 1884 to 1886, the most advanced art was an impressionist technique of open brushwork, open contours, paintings painted on site, outside, en plein air, with a sense of spontaneity, capturing outdoor light. Seurat took all that and just turned it on its head and created something really serious and monumental and classical and thoughtful, and everyone had to come to terms with it. All right. It's going back.
back to slide. So now let's see Vincent van Gogh, the second uh, post-impressionist artist. Uh, Vincent van Gogh was a Dutch post-impressionist painter who is among the most famous and influential figures in the history of Western art. In just over a decade, he created about 2,100 artworks, including around 860 oil paintings, most of which date from the last two years of his life. Now, I'm a painter, I'm the artist, I know that number is incredible. That's almost impossible. You know, he, he was just, you know, just, you know, um, painted like, you know, every single minute, I can say. So um, all the artworks include um, landscapes, still lifes, portraits, and cell portraits, and are characterized by bold colors and dramatic impulsive and expressive brush stroke that contributed to the foundations of modern art. Sadly, um, he was not commercially successful and he um, is you now uh, suicided as 37, came after years of mental illness and poverty. So this is the, you know, the Starry Night painting, uh, which is the, um, you know, one of the most recognized painting in the history of Western culture. It depicts, um, you know, it describes um, the view from the east facing window of asylum room uh, just before sunrise with the addition of an ideal village. And this is his self-portrait when he had ear. And this is his bedroom painting. Um, there is a video about this painting detail uh, in the modern page. So please watch it after this meeting. And this is another his self-portrait painting after he lost his ear. Um, he began to um, hallucinate uh, and suffered attack um, in which he lost consciousness. So during one of these attack, he used a knife to cut his ear so he could later recall nothing about the event. Now let's move on to the third post-impressionist artist, Paul Gauguin. Um, Paul Gauguin worked in an impressionist style early in his career. Uh, Gauguin was interested in expressing a spiritual meaning in his art. Uh, all this he sought on the sun-drenched island of the South Pacific, where he journeyed to escape what he called the disease of civilization. Um, this is one of his famous paintings, Tahitian. Um, the brilliant high key colors of his Tahitian paintings reveal his depth to impressionism. To this lightened palette, he added his own innovations, uh, flattened forms and broad color areas, a strong outline, uh, tertiary color harmonies, a taste for the exotic, uh, an hour of mystery and quest for the primitive. Uh, the woman's pose is derived from the Egyptian art. So uh, when you look at the look at her legs, it shows like you know in profile, and the her shoulders uh, depicted frontly. So Gauguin believed that European art had been enthralled for too long to the legacy of Greece and Rome. Um, and he looked to the art of Egypt, Islam, and Asia to renew it. Oops. So um, there is another video to show um, his um, 
artistic journey based on uh, his journal he left. So please watch that video after the meeting. So um, to fully understand the artist, the creative viewpoint. So we're going to continue to see the modern art after the avant-garde, the newest art movement in the next meeting. And today we have a discussion. It's not really quite related to this chapter, but uh, it's you know generally related to the you know all the art chapters. So here is the topic. So please read the e textbook, uh, page five hundred nineteen, uh, after this meeting, and then uh, please discuss why artists choose same themes and depict the themes differently. Now, um, by tonight, 